I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today, I continue with Section 413 of The Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Book 4. Relative Poverty and Frugality. Original and Radical? The most common mistake about my work is the belief that some years of introspection have produced a take-it-or-leave-it package solution to the urban problem. Rather, I am proposing a methodology and at the same time trying to illustrate it. The methodology is original and radical in the literal sense. It's original by being of and with the origin, and radical in the parallel sense of being of the roots. It is not original or radical if those terms are defined in the vernacular, because it is the oldest, the most used, and the most rooted of all methodologies applied to life. To grasp and to accept this methodology, one needs to be free of the Adam and Eve syndrome, that is to say, free from the historian's mental block that makes one stop at the gateway of prehistory on the tenuous contention that what preceded man was and is devoid of pedagogical, experiential, or methodological importance for him, and therefore cannot disclose anything as to the possible future of man, his mind, his society, his culture. An unoriginal and unradical stance, untenable vis-a-vis -vis contemporary science, unable to fit into the evolutionary momentum, this static historicism is hard to put to explain how matter becomes thought and spirit, how a fiery ball of mass energy, lost in a corner of a run-of-the-mill galaxy, has transformed and transfigured itself into the Earth of today. If this incredible development is seen metaphorically as a cooperative effort of myriad upon myriad of workers constructing their collective home by putting rectangular brick above rectangular brick, the methodology, and if among the immense number has appeared now and then a queer character with extravagant round bricks which are unsuccessfully and disruptively thrown together and end in heaps of rubble, the mutants that have failed, then I have my niche among the myriad, the advocates of rectangular brick, the builders of the structure, not among the strange ones, the going-for-broke, opulent technocrats of all ages. The myriad is the rank and file, beginning with the first original and radical simple cells proceeding up through the successful mutations of all species, vegetal and animal, through the Garden of Eden into the demonic universe of the mind, all along the pain-filled bridge making matter into spirit. It is when the historian wants to be pragmatic that the historian becomes pathetic. His round bricks keep making a fool of him by allowing him some battle victories in a losing war of incongruence. He becomes, with the great technocrats, the staunch advocate of a better quality of wrongness, the true face of the pollution slow, and its entropic backsliding away from the spirit. As with any honest methodology, the original radical methodology proposes a necessity, not its efficiency. It does not suffice itself because efficiency is not sufficiently endowed to be in and in itself. It is plainly a good instrument for the fostering of the construction of the bridge between matter and spirit. To the next question, do we need a methodology? There's a pretty stark answer. We are a methodology, successfully developing itself into an aim. We are free agents inasmuch as we have methodologically invented ourselves from the first ambiguous living cells into what we are, quasi-godlike automatons, free within the most subtle portion of ourselves the mind to prognosticate, indeed to plan, for a less coercive future. This methodology can deliver life, as it has done for eons upon eons to survival and beyond. Therefore, it is within its guidelines that we will rediscover man as a truly compassionate animal. The methodology is the process by which the early vague interiorizations of physical bundles, the first living creatures, grow in number, complexity, compactness, and power along the evolutionary ladder until the person, the civilization, and the culture came to be and become a routine event. This interiorization shall not stop if life will not stop. It shall grow if life will keep evolving. The arcology at its minimum best is but a mechanism necessary but not sufficient for the continuous interiorization of the world of mass energy. It is part of the nuts and bolts pragmatism of matter becoming spirit, of hunger being overcome, of deprivation being cared for, of life becoming personhood. It is one of the species, all the species saying on cores, the course that has a future because it constructs the future by congruently and willfully making horse sense the rectangular brick, or what it does incrementally, thus freeing the spirit for ends unforeseeable, because they are as yet uncreated. Thus concludes Book 4. Book 5. Sacred Spaces. 
synopsis. We, as sensitized matter, perform the miracle of sanctifying that which we behold. But we also mismanage our power when we work in our equipment yards where reverence is conspicuously absent. The sacred spaces where reverence constructs the future more and better than where reverence sings nostalgia for the past. The Gothic masterpiece is as much a successful challenge to the stony and brute nature of physical reality as it is a hymn to the Father God. Why is it a general premise that space per se becomes sacred space as soon as it's perceived? It is because perception implies consciousness of some sort, and since consciousness is a manifestation of sensitivity, the sensitization of matter, it follows that whatever might be the sacredness of matter, more sacredness impregnates the humblest parcel of living stuff than can be found in a whole galaxy from which life has been subtracted. The perception of matter makes it glow with the vicarious sacredness of consciousness, space-time structure. All are a quivering emergence when touched by the sentient stuff of the living. If the steadfastness of life and habit we have of being part of it explain the callousness we demonstrate toward life's constantly miraculous nature. They also suggest the immensity of the spiritual sentient phenomenon, which can take for granted the most improbable of things, consciousness itself, and, what is more, its constant unfolding. Therefore, we are materially a walking, eating, sleeping, doing, struggling sacredness among the sacredness of the vegetal and animal kingdoms, a tiny tidal wave of sacredness pressing against the immensely large and relatively inert reality of mass energy which composes the cosmos. Our level of reality is one in which a certain saturation of sacredness is taken for granted and forgotten as routine. When we speak then about sacred places, we speak of a sacredness beyond the routine. The difference might be of proportion of, or relativity. That is to say, the conscious achievement of a sacred place is to be perceived as literally drowned within the unconscious sacredness of the living phenomenon. Desegregation is tied to such perception. One might ask the worth of building sacred spaces if they are both redundant and puny. The question in another form has been with man for a long time. Why do we need to pinpoint a center of godlike power when every manifestation of life is a centered manifestation of such power? Why God beside life or inside life? Why not God's life or life God? The answer might be simpler than we expect. It might be that in the most intimate folds of life there is and ever more will be an insatiable thirst for comprehensiveness of things, emotions, understanding, wisdom, and reality. The epitome of comprehensiveness is the concept of deity. So much so that we are willing to lose ourselves in it if in exchange we are conceded even a brief glance at its glory. The pursuit of comprehensiveness develops more and more subtle instruments of interiorization. The vivification of inert matter plunges consciously into the evolutionary tide and puts energies and knowledge at its service. The mystic experience, the saintly life, the martyrdom are roads of superhighways toward the experience of a densified reality. Drug addiction is probably a shortcut ending at the feet of idols, since contrary to past which project into the future in the spirit, it looks backwards towards the unified experience of earlier events in duller, simpler perceptions, the Nirvana Syndrome. The religious road to full sacredness is a noble attempt to make do without the real thing. This is because the religious context is that of a simulation, inasmuch as theology works at causing the hypothesis of God to become a reality. Since the theological effort is working on a possibility, it has to simulate such possibility. As we do not have a god yet, and we cannot fully really do without one, we construct a structure that stands for a hypothesis of sacredness, the theological structure. In fact, if one separates the theological structure from the god it is aimed at, one could almost speak of it as a simulation of a simulation. An alternative to the sacredness attempted via theological simulation is the sacredness achieved via esthetogenesis. To convey the difference between the two, one could say that for the theological way, the future is conceptually designed as the progressive identification of life with God, with the mystifying inversion of the whole historical schedule, so that the declared intention is the re-entering of the flock into the divine corral, not as evolution would indicate the progressive creation of both flock and divine corral. In this mix-up of discovery with creation is to be found the confusion about theology and the aesthetic. In its clarification, one can find what distinguishes one from the other. 
If theology is a structure in quest of a content, the aesthetic is a form that defines the content. The first is an invention, the invention of God, and an attempt to anticipate and simulate the performance of such invention. The second is a creation, and as such, within the extreme limits of the fragment, is a particle itself of the mystical body. A sacred space to fulfill its aim should be that environment where shrouding the conceptual and simulative nature of religion is the concrete radiance of the aesthetic creation, a corporeal fragment of divinity. Why is it that the temple is rarely a sacred space? Because the sacred space literally has to be the battlefield, where the transition from simulation to a hypothesis into the actual historical construction takes place. Therefore, it is not a pure space, a non-contaminated place, but the phalanstery, where the improbable affirms itself and makes itself bit by suffering bit into God. Once the anguish innate in the improbable nature of life and the even more hypothetical creation of the Omega God is glossed over by the bartering of society in quest of the golden egg, the genesis of sacredness is stifled and the aesthetic creation does not occur. Therefore, a weak structure of theology, theoecology, see the theology of the sun, is surrounded, shrouded by an even weaker, aesthetocompassionate form. And if the temple rarely succeeds in being a sacred space, the marketplace is even more ill-equipped for access to sacredness. Think of the bank or the gas station. In one, the most abstract of all commodities is made into an icon deified. In the other, the riches accumulated by the genesis of God, the high distillation and concentration of the sun's energy, are collected to be burned on the altar of another idol of contemporary man, the automobile. Where is it then that the sacred space has a chance to reveal itself? In the city, the totality of it, where finally, if only as a seed promising the tree, the comprehensiveness demanded by consciousness begins to show itself, where instruments and symbols, energies and containers, devices and events, physics and metaphysics can focus into a premonition of sacredness and the dynamics necessary to the unending quest for the Omega condition. Is there a contradiction between the necessity of a critical mass, the city, in order to have a, the sacred, and the art object which I tend to see as a fragment of such sacredness? Not in the absolute sense. If one clearly sees that the aesthetic genesis is somehow the interiorization by the artist of the condition of emergency inherent in the critical mass, its improbability, for instance, and the intrinsic anguish which pervades it, and the ability of the artist to transfigure such a condition of emergency, anguish into an objectified emergence, the work of art. In a sense, the city is the suffering implicit in the actualization of the theological simulation while the work of art is a fragment of that which such simulation is ultimately seeking. The aesthetic compassionate city is the synthesis of both the civitas dei. In a way, the artist must think of the city, even if he only carves a twig, because the charge of his anguish must be commensurate, must be the same as the charge of anguish which impinges on mankind. If it is true that little anguish yields a weak artist, the opposite, great anguish, great artist, does not necessarily hold. In fact, if this were true, each ounce of anguish would translate into one measure of harmony, and therefore anguish would become simply a passport to paradise, something one signed up for at a bureaucratic theological archive. But the true unforgiving nature of anguish is its pervasiveness and imperviousness, and only rarely can its armor be pierced to pour out a radiant metamorphosis. What great anguish might give access to, aside from aesthetic genesis, is either mental illness or sanctity, that synopsis of the hypothetical future Omega God. By fragments of God, the aesthetic act, and by the sufferance of an implemented simulation falling short of target, since it is the fate of simulation to mistake the fake for the real, matter makes itself more and more sensitized. And the bridge between matter and spirit is reinforced by new fibers of consciousness, knowledge, and grace. To sustain the journey, now and then comes the blinding light of the saintly or the martyred, the synopsis of God within a synopsis of sufferance. The presence of the theological, the structure in quest of a content, and the presence of the aesthetic, a form defining a content, can or ought to combine in most favorable occasion for sacred space. If we keep in mind that for the theologian the content must be the living content of the imminent God, we cannot avoid what seems to be a mandatory condition. The object must be the container of such imminent God, who is most densely and robustly constituted where humankind is the participant. We are dealing with a civitas day, the new Jerusalem, and a process of emergence in Aesthetic Genesis. To my knowledge, the Safitas Dei can be conceived only within the archaeological methodology, the sine qua non in the definition of sacred space. This would not be so if the archaeological methodology coincided with the theoecological methodology. How can one escape the tautological merry-go-round? 
It might not be possible since the worth of the equipment in life depends on its success, and a success of life will in turn define its worth. The value of utopia has to be found where it ceases to be utopia, because it has become reality. Reality can have a future only if it is able to make the future, the next utopia, into reality. Perhaps the tautological trap is set with the acceptance that whether life succeeds or not, God will still be there. Therefore, we need not demonstrate the existence of divinity by the presence of life, and then turn around and demonstrate the worth of life by the imminence of divinity, as one does by endorsing the reality of the Omega God. If this reasoning is not necessary to achieve sacred spaces, it is necessary to explain to ourselves why sacred spaces are so rare and why they escape rationalization. They demonstrate what they are by being what they attempt to demonstrate. They are, they are forms whose meaning the content is the form itself. They do not have to perform. They are the performance of the imminent God. By way of clarification, one can take another manifestation of homo faber, the bulldozer. The bulldozer is a structure whose form is present only in the performance of the machine. The idle bulldozer is a non-thing. In the instrumental world, there is the thing and the performance of it. In the non-instrumental world, this distinction vanishes. The media and the message coincide not in McLuhan magic, but in sacredness. The dynamics of one, thermodynamics, are useful devices in the creation of the other, the dynamics of the spirit. The dynamics of the photosynthetic process are useful in the production of the vegetal world, whose entelechy will find its path toward the spirit via the duration intensification of evolution. Then the process from matter into spirit, the sacred, has its origin in the instrumental pool, the physical universe, and its aim in the Omega God where all of it, the universe media, is etherealized into the Omega God message. The TV tube is therefore a media which will convey messages, good and bad, pertinent or idle, strong or weak. The truly sacred space is a media message of the sacred eminence of the Omega God. Thus concludes Sacred Spaces. Thus concludes Section 4, 13 of the Omega Seed of Palo Soleri. Tomorrow we will continue with Section 4, 14, Architecture as Information. I will see you then. Olam.